So picture this if you can. It's my second day in the city of Los Angeles. I'm a kid from New Mexico who's come out here to come to college, and I have no idea what I've gotten myself into in this incredible city. All I know is I'm sitting in a van with six strangers, zipping across town from LMU to East LA, as much as one can zip across town in the city of Los Angeles on our freeways, <laughs> and going to this nonprofit where I'm told we're going to meet a man who's founded this organization that works with men and women trying to get out of gang life, men and women who have often been incarcerated. And we go into this nonprofit called Homeboy Industries that at that time was located in East LA. And we're waiting there, and we're told, we're sorry, the man you're meeting with is running a little late. He had another event before this. So we wait a bit, and this man comes in, and I can tell you I will never forget that first moment of seeing Father Greg, or G, as he's officially known to many of us here in LA, because he just had this memorable look. So as a man who's losing his own hair right now, I can tell you I look back very fondly at his beautiful bald head <laughs> and was just captivated by it. He had these thin wire glasses and this bushy white beard. And he introduces himself to all of us. And as he sits down, what strikes me most is that I don't think I can ever think of another person whose eyes have had equal amounts of just pure exhaustion and urgency in them at the same time. And he starts by apologizing for being late. And he says, I just buried another kid. Another kid who died too soon. Another kid whose mom wailed at the funeral. And I'm tired. And I'm exhausted. And he goes on and he says these many things and these incredible stories to us that day. But the one line I'll never forget was he said, you know, as he takes his glasses off and just rubs his eyes, he says, can you imagine what this world would be like if we presumed that the answers to the most complex questions just started with compassion. Can you imagine what it would be like if it just started with compassion? And it's no joke to tell you that my life changed that day. I walked out of that building and had a clear direction of how it would have been unimaginable for me to do other, anything other than pursue that question in ways that would not have been imaginable to me on day one in LA. And so the majority of my life now since that moment has been seeking out how to live that question. And what I realized along the way working in higher ed, living in Latin America, is that a lot of times we kind of have that first part, but we don't know all the elements of it, right? So if compassion were so easy to live, we wouldn't have what we have in this day and age. And so the question is, how do we get to compassion? But to me also kind of what's that end result? And what I want to share to you is the secrets I learned actually living and working in low-income communities in Latin America. And I want to be really clear, I do not wish to romanticize poverty in any way whatsoever. I think poverty is hard. I think it entails incredible humiliation for the people that suffer through it. And I think as a society, to be frank, we, at best, look upon the poor with pity. And at worst, we look upon them with incredible judgment. And what I learned living and working in these low-income communities where people held me up and people supported me was that there were such incredible gifts to be found in each and every community that brought me in. And so here are a few of the things I learned. First thing is how we kind of get to that compassion. And for me, it's about curiosity. And so I work at a university. Of course, I believe in value and intellectual curiosity. But I'm talking about something even a little deeper than that, right? The root of curiosity, cura means to care. And to me, curiosity then is this thing of where we go into an engagement with someone and say, I really care enough, or when I ask this question, when I look at this human being, I want to know the answer, wherever that answer will take me. And as I've said before, that compassion, that idea that Greg got me started on so many years ago, is really trying to figure out that next step. And it's different than empathy. We don't want to kind of cross those two words together, right? Empathy is just, oh, I hear you. Man, I can't imagine, or I can. When we're talking about this, we're talking about also having a desire to alleviate it, having a desire to come with people and go from there. And what I finally learned was ultimately the goal is this, it's connection. And I think no matter where you stand, no matter what you believe about any of these issues, at the end of the day, we all desire connection with our world, with meaning, with curiosity, whatever it may be. And so these were lessons that I got to learn in my two and a half, three years living in Latin America. 
And I got to use them almost right away when I came back to the United States. For anyone that's lived abroad, when you come home, that readjustment is difficult. And I made the very foolish mistake of figuring the first time I would go back and visit my family was to fly on that day before Thanksgiving. Any of you have ever flown on the day before Thanksgiving, you know it is at best one of the worst days of your life. At worst, it is one of the worst days of your life. And so on. And so we're in this airport. A scene many people are no doubt familiar with at some point in your lives. And there's a woman sitting by me because flights are just delayed left and right because of the weather. And she's doing that thing where she's speaking out loud, but to no one in particular. And we're hoping like she's got a Bluetooth in her ear or something, and you kind of look around, and you're like, oh, no, she's just talking out loud to herself. And she'll get really angry, and she'll just say very loud, this sucks. This is the worst thing that could ever happen. And we all look up, exchange glances with one another, those of us that think we're normal in the room with the abnormal person. <laughs> And she continues it again. This sucks. This is the worst thing ever. And I'm thinking about where I came from just months prior, thinking of the challenges I saw in these low-income communities, low-income countries, and I want to get up on my social justice high horse and say, you want to know what sucks? Let me tell you some stories that suck. But at the last moment, those better angels come in, and instead my curiosity is aroused. And I think to myself, I want to meet her on this. And so the next time she says that line again, I very loudly respond to her and just say, I hear you. And she looks a little startled. She looks at me and I say, I hear you. This really sucks. And I bet we all just want to get to our families or wherever we're going. And her lips start quivering and these tears start streaming down her eyes and we learn a little more. And she says, I just learned my son has stage four cancer. My baby boy stage four cancer and I just want to get on this damn airplane and I want to get to him and I want to embrace him and I want to hold him and she's crying and I mean what can you do you cry with her and we cry for a while and the only thing I can think to say is I'm so sorry and then as we kind of labor through that awkward silence that curiosity comes into my mind and I say can you tell me about your son and she shares stories about this man, the father he is to his young kids, the beautiful little boy he was growing up. And we're just kind of crying through these stories as I'm getting to know this man. And she says, can I tell you the best part about him? I say, of course. She goes, I don't know if it's the best part, but God, he has the worst parts in the world <laughs> as well. And we just kind of fall together in our laughter in that moment. And we wait through the delay and go through it. And I get on my flight, and one of the eight people sitting in that area next to me says, it's a really good thing you did back there. And I feel anything but good in that moment, because I almost trapped her in either judgment or pity. And it was only kind of by the grace of that I managed to arouse that curiosity, so my compassion was activated. And for one moment in a crappy airport terminal, we had a connection together. Years later, that same curiosity, that same compassion, that same connection would be turned around on used on me in ways I could never imagine. Got a little son, he's light of my world like everyone knows with best children, and when he was about nine months old, we went through the thing everyone goes through, of kind of introducing your kid to foods, and we weren't worried. We don't have any food allergies, anything like that. So I remember sitting him down with peanut butter, we play the peanut butter jelly song, we're excited, and you know, as much as I'm confident about it, I'm also the anxious parent. My wife might say I'm the paranoid parent out of the two of us. So I feed it to him and I watch him like a hawk. And a little like red dot appears on his forehead. And I'm like, babe, I don't think that was there. And she comes and she looks and she goes, I just bumped his head. Don't worry. And goes back to the kitchen. And almost instantly, his face changes in ways that are really hard to explain. And I instantly realize what's going on. And I say, call 911. He's having an allergic reaction. And I think, you know, my wife's got her back to me, thinks I'm joking at first. They say, again, call 911, he's having an allergic reaction. And um, we go downstairs and we wait for the fire department to come, and I have to ask a question that no parent ever wants to ask, and it's the only question going through my head. And it's just simply, is my kid going to die? Is my kid dying? Over and over and over. 
It's only minutes, but it seems like hours. And the fire department pulls up, jumps out of the truck, runs over, delivers what I later learned is epinephrine, because I know nothing about this world, and it's this life-saving drug. Now, if you've ever been in a situation like this, the moment you are most helpless, you often want to help. And I am not a medical expert, but I'm standing over nervously trying to figure out how to support my kid, my family, etc. And I hear this voice behind me as they're attending to my son. And the voice just says to me a few times, your son has a peanut allergy. My daughter has one too. He's going to be okay. I need you to come with me. And then arms go around me. And he's telling this to me, calming me down. Your son has a peanut allergy. My daughter has one too. He's going to be okay. Come with me. And I get pulled aside by this other firefighter that was on the call. And we stand there while they work on my son. And he explains to me that every time he gets this call in the station, his throat catches. Because he remembers that moment with his daughter. And he remembers how horrifying it was. And he's crying. I'm crying. And what I think is so important about this is if you work in the medical professions, if you work in emergency services, you deal with horrible situations day and again. And it can be hard to arouse our curiosity and our compassion for every single one. But this man had a connection. We shared something. And in that moment, he shared that kindness with me in ways that I can't explain to you what it meant. So humor me for a moment with your own curiosity and your own compassion. When your kid is deathly allergic to a piece of food, it becomes one of the most horrifying day-to-day -day things in the world to just leave your house, as dramatic as that sounds. On a regular basis, as a society, we value coming together and celebrating over a shared meal. Meals are horrifying. Birthday parties, it's what's going to be in the cookies? What's going to be in the cupcakes? Do we need to bring our alternate ones? And it's really, really easy to trap a kid in this moment of their lives. And to see your kid is nothing but the worst moment. And when I'm tempted to do that, I think of that firefighter. I think of this little boy who deserves so much better than being trapped in that worst moment. And I remind myself, I need to do more. I need to let this kid be the full human he deserves to be. And so I can't tell you how many times this firefighter's mind, or this face has come to my mind as we go to a birthday party, as we go out to dinner with friends, to remind myself, my kid is so much more than this moment. And so maybe you're sitting here and you're thinking, man, those are some pretty extreme stories. I haven't had anything like that, and I probably won't. I hope you're right. But I think we miss the point if we only think curiosity, compassion, and connection matter in those most extreme moments. So years ago, my wife and I had a chance to do something that was incredibly stupid and brilliant all at the same time. We saved money religiously, we quit our jobs, and we traveled around Southeast Asia for as long as we could until we had to come back and get jobs again. And when we went to Bali, I remember this moment where every place we went, people greeted us with this beautiful phrase where their hands would come together and they would say namaste. I had tried and failed at yoga. I'm not the most limber person in the world. And so I had heard that phrase namaste, but only in a yoga setting. And I feel a little naive as I realize there's a deeper cultural context here. And so one day I asked this man, you know, what exactly does this mean? Because it's the greeting we're getting everywhere. And in broken English, he explains it to me as best he can, where he says, you know, it's the spirit in me dancing with the spirit in you. And I love that translation. And I later looked it up and saw it's that idea of the divine or the goodness in me recognizing or greeting the divine or the goodness in you. But that notion of the divine or the good in us coming out and dancing with the good in another person, I think is what the world needs right now. In a very cheesy and yet urgent kind of way, it's what we need. One of my favorite poets, poets, Warson Shire, has a line where she says, I come from two countries. One is thirsty. One is on fire. Both need water. And so my challenge to you all today is how will that goodness in you Dance with every person you encounter. Whether it's that annoying coworker that you can't stand to see on Monday morning, whether it's our family that we're sometimes ignoring in the loss as we just kind of scroll through our phones, how are we going to kind of bring that spirit of namaste? How are we going to kind of answer that call of letting compassion be the start of the answer to every challenge we see before us?